I want to welcome everyone to another session of our Women Lead webinar series brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Michelle Berquist, your host today, and we are delighted yet again to bring you another of our webinar series to our Association of Professional Women. Some of you might not know, our webinars and our Women Lead webinars are designed for you as a professional leader in business, whether you're a female leader, a woman leading people, or projects, or teams, or companies, and we try to select topics and themes that support your goal to lead and achieve and succeed more effectively in business. So, little details, our webinars are just shy of one hour, and our thought leader today is ready to share some fabulous and some wonderful insights on a topic that I love, which is the Million Dollar Business Playbook for Diverse Founders. Um, just a little bit more logistics, and we're going to get right into it. At the half hour mark, we're going to be answering any questions that you have that you've submitted um, during the online presentation portion of our webinar. So please feel free to put in questions in our Q&A box. And I'm very excited to introduce our thought leader today. And our thought leader is Kim Folsom. For those of you that listened in, Kim was one of our CEO interviews at our last Women Owner Summit, which was very, very well received. Kim is the founder of Lyft Development Enterprises, and she's also the co-founder and CEO of Founders First Capital Partners. In addition to that, um, what Founders First Capital Partners is, it's a small business growth accelerator and a revenue-based venture fund that's focused on helping underserved, employer-based small businesses with funding and helping them achieve exponential growth. I have to personally say I've been through the boot camp last year. It was phenomenal for just the perspective and things that I learned in growing a business enterprise. Kim's background is that she's a high-tech executive and she is a serial entrepreneur. That's a very special title there. Serial entrepreneur with 25 years of experience growing innovative technology companies. She has experience in founding, leading, building startups for which she's raised over $30 million in institutional venture financing. So she's all that to all of you that are listening in. Kim either founded or she was a key executive of the following ventures. And I remember her journey in some of these different ventures. Show You How, Drive Cam, and Seminar Source. And prior to this stage in her career, she was an executive at National Dispatch Center. Whew, this is tiring, Kim, and you got so much background here. National Dispatch Center, Loose Forward, Altel Systematics, Great American First. I mean, basically, she is one, one, one smart lady on running and leading businesses. So, Kim, welcome to Women Lead Webinars, and you, my dear, are in control. So, start the webinar. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Um, it's just been, this is uh, my uh, pleasure and passion to, to share uh, this information and insight with you all today. And I'm so honored um, by Michelle and the, and the members of CWI to, to be here and share this information with you. Um, as Michelle mentioned, I have um, been involved with a lot of different companies, founding them and funding them. And but I must say, I've also uh, helped mentor and coach over a million people. And so, uh, as a result, um, uh, I wanted to share this information with you all today so that um, Hopefully, it, give you, it will give you some insight as to options that are available to you. Uh, if you'll please advance the slide. All right, so our specific agenda, we're going to talk about a lot of things. You can see a lot here, but some highlights. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, what's so big about running a, a multi-million dollar business. We're going to start with, you know, as I was sharing with Michelle before we started, think of it as crawl, walk, run. And I'll explain to you some background behind, you know, the million dollars from our perspective is the crawl piece. And um, then, you know, it's not for everybody. Some people are comfortable where they are. So it's some measurements to have you kind of look at, you know, is this a fit for you? Next, we're going to talk about just kind of some game rules. What does it mean and, and what's involved with running a business of this? And then specifically around, being able, what does it mean to create a playbook that is specifically for you? 
Um, next, we're going to cover some plays that make up this playbook. We're not going to cover all 15 here, but we're going to highlight a, you know, the first five um, because of our, our time uh, that we have available. Uh, we'll do a summary on the last um, 10, and then from there, we'll do gonna give you a way of how you can learn more after this session. If you could please advance the slide. Not working, huh? Okay. You got it. All right. So first, let's start with the power of a million dollar business. So what does that mean? Um, you know, if you're if you know of someone who's running a million dollar business, there's some really great outcomes that come out of doing that, you know, as opposed to when it's less than that. First of all, generally, when you're running a million dollar business, you have um, a team that you're working with. And you also have a chance to stand out amongst a number of people, and I'll share with you why, just a small percentage of people that are running million dollar businesses. But with that uh, accomplishment, uh, one of the outcomes is that recognition that goes along with it and being um, recognized as a leader and also a job creator because you know it takes a, a team to really able to, to make that happen. The next is with that amount of resources, if you're going to go about it in the way that we're suggesting, you also have that level of um, financial security, not just for you, but also for your family. And sometimes we as women may not be as comfortable with uh, going through and um, uh, you know, generating a million dollar business for, for yourself, then do it for your family. Um, next, uh, from there is the ability to make an impact. You know, if you're generated a successful business and you've been able to do it uh, with that level, you're solving a problem or you're making a difference or you're providing an exceptional experience for someone. And then the last piece of it is your, the problem solving and you're doing it for a large group of folks. So when you think about the power of a million dollar business, ask yourself, are you interested in any of these outcomes that I've just shared with them, shared with you? Are any of these compelling to you? If so, you should really dig in deeper and, and see what it takes to make that happen. Please advance to the next slide. Okay, so um, what the, we, we've talked about one piece of what this means as far as a um, you know, the power of a million dollar business. But then the other part of the title is for diverse founders. So what's so unique about diverse founders? Well, first, let's make certain that we all understand what I mean by diverse founders. Diverse founders are women, minority, and military veterans. They all have a similar characteristic as it relates to growing businesses. And I'll talk, uh, tell you about that in a minute. First, um, I want to share with you the power of small businesses and define what those are. Small businesses in the U.S. are those businesses that are generating between a dollar or less than 10 million in revenue. And so, believe it or not, when you compare small businesses to medium businesses to large businesses, um, you know, they're the largest group. The, sm the smallest group of the, those three, large, medium, and, and, and small um, the largest group are like the publicly traded corporations of which there's less than 5,000 of those and those are, are you know, consolidating every day. More and more are added to the small business side. As you can imagine, there are a lot of people that are in business that are generating $10, but guess what? If they have a bank account with a business name on it and they um, are filing taxes, then they're considered a small business. Um, a little bit more, when you look at these small businesses, the large percentage of them, you know, I talked about there's 28 million of them, 22 million of those are generally what's called solopreneurs. They're an individual making uh, $75,000 or less. Generally, it's way more than less, but, you know, that's a large group of them. So that means that a little more than 6,000 are what's called employer-based businesses. So, you know, in, in generating this million-dollar business, it's about being an employer-based business. A little other fact, less than 1% of small businesses earn more than 1 million in revenues annually, led by diverse founders, okay? So women, minority, veterans, they're the small group that are having businesses that are over a million dollars. And when you look at, you know, what people always say, well, gosh, the reason why this doesn't happen is funding. That's one thing. But when you look at access to funding, this diverse group gets less than 3% of VC funding. 
and less than 20% of traditional debt or bank financing goes to this group. So there's a gap with regards to getting access to capital. Another uh, key fact of why this is different for these diverse founders is when you look at many of us uh, started our careers in larger organizations, be it middle or large corporations, 95% of that leadership is not diverse professionals. So it's the, the next one is that most of those successful business owners that are running, you know, million or millions of dollars of businesses, they learn how to run these large profitable businesses by working for other large profitable business in a, in the, in a leadership role. So as a result, most diverse founders may not have the experience of what it takes to actually growing and funding and leading these large prof profitable organizations. But um, statistics has shown that with the right training, resources, and capital, businesses led by diverse management team will outperform those that are run by, you know, a homogeneous team, you know, all a homogeneous is not just all guys or all white guys. It's having that diversity. Those diversity of thought really helps. Uh, please advance to the next slide. So another thing for you to consider is this building a million, you're, you know, you're one of these diverse founders and ask yourself, does this really, you know, work for you? Um, some other kind of uh, uh, relevant situations. You may be a professional, you know, graduated from college, have 10, 20 plus career expertise, and uh, either got stuck or downsized. And, and you had, when you came into that business, it seemed to advance to a higher position of your dreams, but just ha hasn't happened, be it the glass ceiling or what other type of situation that has prevented you from getting to where you want to be. You require, you know, additional income to support your family and build for the retirement from where you are today but you have no prior expertise with running a business. And if you're running a business, your business is earning annually less than a half million. So if, if one of these particular scenarios um, or situations relate to you, then this may be something that you aspire to. Please advance to the next slide. So um, more to look at is this for you. It really comes down to some people think, well, gosh, when I want to build a, a million dollar business, it's about, you know, just having all the, the time off that I want and not being able to, uh, uh, you know, do what people tell me to do. Really, for you to build that million dollar business, you have to be in the situation such that you're solving a big problem for someone. And in fact, someone thinks, well, somebody already came up with those ideas. I can't think of any good idea. There's 99 problems that, out there and more that you could uh, get paid to solve. All you need to do is start asking a group of people and, you know, think about solving a big problem for, um, you know, a group of folks. And many times that same problem that you can be solving for a group of folks, when you really think about the unique profile, be it based on their age, their location, their demographics, some other characteristic, they may have similar problems. So that's one is you really need to look at that you're, you're willing to start small, but eventually solve a problem for a group of a million people with similar problems. The next is you wanna make certain you're gonna build a profitable recurring model that allows you to generate at least 50% margin, ideally 100% margin. So you gotta look at not just um, are you're in business and you don't have you're not generating generating enough income such that you are able to pay yourself pay your people and and you know pay your responsibilities because if you're not then um, you know that's there, there's there's a way that you could be doing it better um, so you know think about it from a standpoint of economics and that's really really important the other is that you're going to not just try to do it all yourself and you're not going to be an expert at at everything. You're going to have a great team of folks that are going to help you with delivering, with solving that problem and complement your skills. You want to hire a great team that's better than you in certain aspects that are needed to solve this problem. The other key component you're going to need is to have partner with distribution to help you grow. 
You know, there are a lot of people that have captive group of, of customers that you can um, work with in order to help them better serve their customer. And then the last piece is that you can always strive to, you need to always strive to improve and innovate and add value with what you do. Don't get complacent. Realize that just when you think that you've you know, got something done well and improved, that you're constantly getting feedback from your customers in order to do that. So if this sounds like it's for you, please keep listening because we've got more. We're going to talk about the playbook next. So, um, and, and recognize this playbook is not a standard book. It's not a one size fits all. Every one of us are unique. Now the structure can be similar, but all of us have specific strengths and talents. So this playbook, your playbook, will allow you how to leverage your talents and strengths as well as it helps you build and demonstrate your confidence so that you have that way of winning over more and more of that, uh, a, a good percentage of that million a group of customers to serve. And you get to learn how to use your strengths, talents, and confidence to score big or you know, win with building that thriving million dollar business. Please advance to the next slide. So you may think, well, gosh, that sounds good, but you know what? Is that just a concept? Is it really a useful idea? Well, I'd like to share with you three success stories that are really small, but they'll give you some context of how people have used their unique playbook to, to, to win in building a business that is at least a million dollars, if not more. The first is an IT consulting practice that in, they were about seven years old and they were dealing with lumpy revenues. And by having uh, working with building their own unique pl uh, playbook, they're now on path to double their revenues and are very satisfied with their business performance. Performance. Another uh, success story I'd like to share with you is an accounting service practice where this woman, phenomenal woman, has great expertise, a CPA at one of the big firms, but wanted to you know, uh, advance and couldn't get to partner, so she decided to create her own practice, but really was challenged in wanting to scale beyond that. So looking at building so with her own playbook, she actually uh, built a unique service that allowed her to match accountants and small business to deliver um, better operating efficiencies for the accountants that she supported and provide improved financial management services to her clients. And one more um, success story I'd like to share with you is an e-commerce diet company that you know began uh, with their play before they worked on their playbook. They were a me too company. I mean, there's so many e-commerce diet products out there. I mean, there are like thousands of them. But when they really started working on their unique playbook, they were able to improve the um, profit margins for their company by three times, such, a, such that allowed them in the next 24 months to offer a unique service to groups suffering from autoimmune disease. So in each of these areas, these folks have found a way to build a profitable million dollar plus business that allowed them to be unique and also serve a big need that wasn't served prior to a company. Okay, so um, let's look at some plays. Let's first talk about, you know, what does it take to build the business to support the life you want? Because that's really what the first thing is. You know, you want to do something that help support what you want to do. You want to love what you want to do. And the first piece of it is, I got to be honest with you, it takes hard work, continuous hard work. So the first piece of play one is the grit piece. You've got to commit to working hard, being tenacious, persistent, and resolve to never give up, no matter what you have uh, someone who says, you know, your baby's ugly with regards to your business, that you're going to um, continue uh, to be committed to your business no matter what obstacle you encounter. You just realize it's a cycle and every day you, it starts again. Do things that, um, you know, that you start your day off to, you know, to, to commit to the grit that, to keep that going. The next is passion with regards to play one. The ability to leverage your expertise to do what you want and, and, and enjoy, that's um, another key component of building uh, the business that, 
that supports the life you want. The third piece is about the dollars, ladies. Commit to take, use your business to take control of your financial capability to support your family, your life, and your retirement because that is a really, really key component for you to measure your success. Um, many of us uh, women, most of us women, um, you know, a lot of it, um, that financial support is on our shoulders. So it's really important when you look at your business that, um, that it not only just support, you know, your, your family, but it supports you and your retirement. Um, the other uh, a component, key component of Play One, of building this business you want is the impact. Um, do something that's really making a difference to a large group of individuals. And if it's not making a significant impact, continue to dig to make certain that you're doing that. And we'll talk a little bit more about strategies for that. The third is, um, and this may be one of those reasons why people left that big corporate job, is that they wanted to be able to work with the integrity that supports them, um, their, what they subscribe to, their, their brand, their personal brand. So this is an important quality and standard that you build into the organization that you want. And the last piece is, um, and this can be a hard one, um, that you commit to uh, always taking feedback to drive change and also stretch you to grow positively. Sometimes it's really hard to hear um, that, you know, that, that the, the negative feedback, you know what, this is okay, it's not perfect. Well, you know, it's between you and somebody else if you're gonna discount your price. And then if you're constantly having to, um, uh, to compete on price, then there's work that you need to do in building your own playbook that you're really solving a unique problem. So in summary, that, you know, having that personal transformation is something that you're going to go through as part of building that business that supports the life you want. Next, uh, so you got play one, you've done these things that we talked about. How do you score when you um, put into place uh, play one. The first is um, when you've done those things um, that we mentioned in this first play, that customers will buy your solution because it delivers top value. When you're having to compete on price, then you're not really delivering a significant value to them. And that value to them generally relates to you're helping them save time, you're helping them either generate revenues, you're giving them a unique critical experience that they wouldn't otherwise have, it, have or you're providing some unique ex experience or expertise that they wouldn't otherwise have. So when you think about this play one, about building the life that you want, really make certain these are the ways that you measure that you're scoring with this play. So play two, um, you don't have to do this alone. Join a team, join a league, and get an experienced coach. These two things are so critical as far as the second play. So many business owners go it alone, and that's a tough road to hoe. Um, they work singularly on their business, and they're facing challenges, and it's so hard to give up. And then you end up doing some other things that can be either even more destructive, be it you know, not being able to sleep, not being able to you know, take time to enjoy some things that you want and other types of, of things. So don't do it alone. Get into a powerful ecosystem that is supportive, that will provide you with support um, and these know-how ways of applying and helping you build your own um, playbook. You don't have to do this alone. And then the other thing in the last, it seems 10 years, all of these people that have come to play that are coaches and they've never done anything at all. It's important that you go through and you select an expert coach that can help you um, through those road bumps um, and teach you how to grow your business. It's, it, you need someone who's more than just a yes person or there to take your call. If your goal is to grow a million dollar business, just like those athletes that are um, seeking to get into a professional uh, uh, a league with regards to their business, all because uh, when you're playing for you know the NFL or M, uh, NBA or those things, all of them have trainers and coaches that have the expertise of doing what they want to do. We have to use the same expertise as well. 
So when you've put in place play two and you've joined a league or you've got, and you've got an experienced coach, how will you score using this play? First of all, the right coach is your backup. When you go through and you break, make this challenge, it either you're trying to connect with a new partner, you're trying to um, get access to a new customer and those types of things. Because they've done it before, they can give you some suggested strategies or help coach you through those things. Um, if someone cannot help you with those things, then they may not be the other coach, be the right coach, because the right coach to help you get there has coached others to growing that million dollar business. The other thing, the right coach will help you uh, confidently compete um, on a results driven strategy. Again, as a diverse founder, um, you have to prove that you can deliver on an ongoing basis. Many times as a diverse founder, you'll have people who will, um, will doubt you, uh, will not give you the benefit of the doubt, and you know, will constantly challenge you or, or always give you a way of giving up. And so you have to always look at you know, results or score, how you're gonna keep score to prove that you're making progress every day. And sometimes that progress can be what you've learned each time. The last piece, you, you should be, um, if you've achieved and scored on this play, you're in a peer group of business owners that are positive, encouraging, and challenging you to grow. That's another key thing. Don't do this alone. Many of us spend 80% of our time working in our business, but by doing these things, this gives you the way with Play2 to, to work on your business and be able to work on your business with a framework and an ecosystem that can help you uh, score and reach your goal. Okay, in our uh, Play3, dream big, which is another key area for us as uh, diverse business owners. Too often it's like, well, I'm in business because I've got a few clients, they're paying me, but they're not paying me enough and, and those type of things, which that's a great way of getting started. But use that framework of what you've done to look at how you could take what you're doing today to build that business that could grow to be a $10 million business. There's nothing wrong with you deciding, hey, I think I wanna be a million dollar business, but you know, there's nothing wrong with being able to look at if everything was aligned and if you wanted to, you could build that $10 million business. So dream big, but it's okay to take small bites. The other thing, is think of your market and the ability to serve a million customers. So it may mean, and the great thing that you have today is with Google and other market research, think about your customers that you have today. What common um, characteristics are they? Uh, be it uh, gender, income, income, social, recreation, or those types of things. And be, you'd be surprised that, you know, um, that you may have uh, your, you know, identified a group of customers or multiple groups of customers. And sometimes that can be a challenge is, you know, being able to, to uh, try to uh, do things too big. Um, once you've identified, you know, you're, you are, you have that group of a million plus customers, then really assess your current business, your customers relations and, and determine the size and scope of it. You don't want to be trying to serve, you know, too many um, diverse customers because you don't have the resources to do it. It may be that you have to start with serving, you know, a specific group of, of customers, really nail that down, and then go through and find out if there's a secondary or third. But you first make certain that you're super serving one customer base. For example, uh, think about, um, I use the example of the success story of the company that was helping serve various people on a, a diet. And you know, there are people dieting for different reasons. And what they really, when they went through this exercise of really you know, thinking big, but starting to pare down and understand their customer base, they found that people were on diets for different reasons. It could be dieting because they're getting married, because they are trying to get into the military, or that they have some specific health issues. And then when they really started looking at the size of the people with different characteristics, they found 
Um, also looking at, you know, who are the competitors reaching those different characteristics? And they found that there wasn't anyone serving um, one specific group. And so they found that, you know, there was complementary ways that they could, you know, tweak what they were doing to serve that market. Um, so, you know, uh, look at that from a standpoint of assessing uh, that scope and then look at, you know, the value of what you do to your customers. Again, looking at that example of that company that transformed from being a diet company to an uh, serving an autoimmune um, market that, you know, really helping them manage their nutrition was really very key. And they found that there's a couple things they could do to, to complement that. The last piece of it is when it comes to actually trying a serving a solution and testing it out, start with winning a first 10 that you can go through and have at least 10 folks that you start and test something out with. You know, too often when people decide to do something, they start with a large group. It could be thousands or, or um, you know, hundreds of thousands. Win the first 10, not just that they tried it, but they love it and they love it enough that they're going to rave to other people about it. And when you've really started with this small group of 10 and you've got them as raving fans, then you're ready to move on to the next group. But again, they have a problem that's not being served by somebody else. You have a unique solution and there's an economic value exchange that go along with it. And when you've done that, we're going to talk about how you score with this particular play. So when you've gone through and tested, validated what your offering is to this 10 group of customers and that you found that there's an economically viable solution, meaning we talked about the profit margin that you're looking at at you know, some point, and it may be when you're starting out, you may not get to that economic situation, but with either time or other features, but when you've gotten to that economic value proposition, um, then you can use that to uh, be driven by a profitable, scalable group, meaning that you can go from that 10 to hundreds to thousands of people uh, and grow it there. Um, until you've reached that, uh, you know, value proposition to that customer and they've said, yep, it's serving all my needs uh, uniquely, differently, then um, you're still got work to do it. But um, it's really important with regards to helping you achieve that big dream. Uh, the next is, uh, you know, kind of complementing uh, play three and owning that niche market. So you've gone through, you've got your, your uh, unique value uh, sorted out with these 10 groups and it's really important going through and making certain that when you look at serving that market you're doing it in a market that's not being served by other people you do not want to be a me too trying to do the same thing someone else is doing and sometimes it could be a different niche market there are so many people chasing the millennial market, for example, but not very many people are doing stuff for, for boomers or boomer women or boomer single women. I mean, think of it in those particular, you know, uh, elements with regards to, hey, this is what you do. What are all the different markets that could be using what you do? And, and sometimes it may be that uh, if you need help with thinking about them, Ask some other folks with regards to, to that. And when you don't see um, what you're doing evident there, then you've got to ask those questions about, hey, is this valuable to them? And once you've got that 10, um, you know, it's being able to, to identify that niche market of a million or, you know, a, at least a million folks that you're serving, but then complement that with an industry. Say, for example, um, uh, one uh, a company, they had a beauty product that when they started, they were selling the beauty product where everybody buys a beauty product at uh, convenience stores like Rite Aid and, and CVS and all of those things. It was a, a, a kind of interesting artistic uh, twist on serving nails. But when they took, when they looked at other industries where, you know, the the, the reasons why people were buying their product, they found, gosh, you know what? Um, you know, we're competing with 10 other nail uh, solutions in this convenience market. But when they looked at, well, gosh, there's probably other industries we could be in. They looked at the promotional industry. 
and trade shows and where people are trying to make themselves unique. And as a result, you know, the, the trade show industry is well more than a hundred million dollar industry. And so that wasn't a, a way for them to go through and find a unique niche market for their product that they weren't competing with 10 other people. And so they could go to all the different uh, folks that were trying to promote their product or service uh, in a trade show environment. That's one example. Um, and you know, when you are that unique and only person, you get a chance to not compete on price, but you compete on value. Same, for example, that nail product. When you are one of 10 in a specific distribution channel, you're going to go have to compete with someone saying, you know, I want a volume discount or want some type of discount. But when you're the only one and it's really adding value, you get to compete on what value you're delivering so you're not being hammered down on price. And even more important, when you think about the value that you deliver to your customer, either you can be an aspirin, a vaccine or a cure for cancer. When you're an aspirin, think about it. There's so many uh, white label uh, aspirins out there, but when you're a vaccine, it's unique. If somebody has to have a vaccine at least you know once or or recurring. When you think about the flu vaccine, it's um, you know important. But if you're a cure for cancer, it's a must have. And so really you want to drive to make certain that your product has that level of value to your customer. And when you do, um, uh, you're able to uh, garner a much better economic position with your customer than, than otherwise. Um, but to get there, you need to have some really deep conversations with your customer about um, why they um, why they need something? What's the impact? And you know, when you go through and have these deep conversations with your clients, it can sometimes be an uncomfortable situation to get started. But if you start that practice and share with them, hey, you know, I I appreciate you know that you're using my product, but I'd like to you know find out how we're helping you so that I can either provide a better service or better product and those types of things. And when you get into that routine conversation with them, they appreciate that and you gain a lot of insight. And then once you gain that insight from your customers, and um, this is a great uh, situation for those solopreneurs that are out there, you know how you can grow your business, you start with your the conversation with your current customers, then take it the conversation to um, groups that may be similar to their your customers that are not actually your customers today. But you really need to have those deep conversations before you're able to really get on the path of owning that um, that niche market. And at the same time, understand what other alternatives do they look at. You need to understand the competition. Um, what your what who is your competition uh, compared to you? When you think of the you know the reasons why people buy your product, um, you also need to look at what alternatives that they look at and what did they what did they go through to decide to buy your product versus not buy your product? You want to know what you do well and what you don't do well, as well as what your competitors do well and don't do well. And then you have that opportunity to serve that gap if you have the capability to do so. Uh, so how do you score when you own that niche market? The first one is you have a very specific large group that sees you as a differentiated solution. And that different, differentiated solution is unique and valuable and a must have, a must have for them. And as a result, you get to compete on value based on price instead of being a commodity price where you're having to constantly um, slash your prices. And a niche market, when you have that identified group that is, has similar, similar uh, needs and characteristics and a path to uh, acquire them, that gives you a defined path to scale your business. Uh, the last detailed plan uh, play we're going to talk about is becoming tops with your customer. This goes, you know, uh, kind of complements the last play when you actually have those conversations with your customer. Really, you really need to be in the position where you're having conversations with your customers 
on a daily basis. It's really, really important. When you think about um, the scenario with large companies like via, you know, IBM or Pepsi or, um, uh, you know, uh, Chipotle, you know, um, a lot of those businesses, Apple, Costco, all of those businesses, they make a point of talking with tens if not hundreds of their customers on a daily basis so they have that ongoing relationship with them and it's not just about conversations they also look at their interactions with regards to them they continuously gather data so you know in addition to having those deep conversations with uh, your customers Continuously put in your plan of business operations to survey and interview your top customers. It's really important. Too often, us as small businesses, we're spending so much time just trying to, you know, uh, you know, uh, balance plates. But if you don't have that time to survey and interview and talk with your customers on an ongoing basis, your competitors will. So it's important that you understand what are the top needs for your customers and you're constantly gaining insight and value about how you can improve your solutions. Um, you wanna learn how to be the best um, to serve your customers in different environments and different markets because it may be that you find that your customer you know, looks to use you just in this particular situation, but they may use your competitor in other situations, which um, presents an opportunity for you to expand your offering to your customer. And many times you may not find that out until you have those deep conversations with them. The ideal situation is such that you're able to gather that insight with them without it being a forced process. We're gonna talk about how to score when you could become tops with your customers. So, um, again, uh, from your goal when you become tops with your customer is to make your solution, worst case, a vaccine for them. You know, it's something they have to have. It's just like hygiene. You know, you wouldn't, you know, leave the house without brushing your teeth or, you know, putting on deodorant, taking a shower, that they would not run their business or do what they do without including you as part of that. That's the worst case. The best case is that they view you as a cure for cancer that they say, gosh, I must have that, I must have that. And if I don't have that, then it has a you know, detriment to my survival. And it's possible to do, but you just need, really need to have that deep relationship with your customer. Um, the best case scenario is that if there's a way for you to build a type of relationship or interaction with your customer, such that you can gain insight into that usage behavior about your customer um, and their behavior, their insight, and their preferences on an ongoing basis without maybe you just having to talk to them. And this goes into uh, the concept of using data and insights to compete. Those businesses that do gather that ongoing behavior, insight, and preferences are uniquely, uniquely position than those that don't. Think of like Amazon and Apple and Google and those types of companies. Before they had all this automation that they have today, they had as part of their practice to not only you know, deliver the service, but allocate some time to look at how is a customer using what we do? How do they value it? What are they using and what are they not using? When I look at my base of customers, who am I losing and why am I losing them? Why did they go away? You have to allocate time to be able to get that information because this will allow you to continuously improve your solution. So um, just because of our time constraints, we're not gonna be able to go through all of the different plays, but this is just a <laughs> summary of some additional six through 14 plays that we're going to cover perhaps in a future um, CWI webinar. I'm thinking yes on that, Kim. I think we'll, we'll do another one is what I'm thinking, but yes, good stuff, so absolutely. All right. Are you about are you kind of um, wrapping up then, or do you want yes, to? Yes, the a last of... one is if you want to learn more, 
Um, our, stay tuned for our part two of the <laughs> million dollar playbook for diverse uh, founders. Uh, and we'll go into that in a further deep, deeper level. I also want to take this time to, send, uh, to extend an invitation to those business owners that are at least a $250,000 annual revenue because we actually, this is some of what we do with um, our Founders Bootcamp and helping our business owners with building their unique playbook. Um, so I've included a link. Um, it's foundersfirstcapital.com forward slash qualify where you can apply for our next upcoming boot camp. And the last, if there's any questions that you happen to have, I've included my contact information. You can contact me by email at kfolsom at um, f1stcp.com. And with that, uh, we'll open it up for questions. We will. And that was really awesome. I want to say again, you know, just for everybody, I think I'm in such a unique position, Kim. You know, I know you've worked with so many people, but going through the boot camp really opened my eyes, you know, for our association for connected women of influence. And the interesting part of some of the questions that are coming in, a lot of it is around finding, you know, what I call riches and niches, right? You're talking about finding the vaccine. And a lot of people, I mean, just kind of like collectively, some of the questions I'm seeing is, you know, one specific one about finding if they're going to be a vaccine is how do they go about, and this one says, how would I go about researching what my competitors don't do? Any strategies or advice you might give to our um, attendees on that for small businesses? Um, the first piece is to start with customers. Um, you know, uh, and you do, you know, take the time to do the research. Um, and you can do it in a variety of ways. You can find out, um, talk to your customers um, and look at, you know, when you selected our solution, what other things did you consider? And, uh, and you know, did you ever consider these alternatives and why or why not? Um, but the best way of finding out what, what your customers don't do is to talk to people who decided not to use them, the people who didn't use them before. Um, I mean, the cool thing about the whole social media thing is you can always post that question. Hey, I'm looking at using X, Y, Z. Has anybody used them before? And tell me what it's, what was your experience? Um, you can do that with your LinkedIn network. Um, that's a, you know, a trusted group that you can always uh, reach out to, but that's the first thing. And in fact, you know, one, one principle that some of the, uh, people in Silicon Valley use as far as disruptive is they go through and say, take a billion dollar market and ask 10 of their customers what they don't like about them and come up with a solution that addresses what people don't like about them. Well, and I think, you know, that gets into I'm going a little deeper on that one, because, you know, I know when people start talking about asking their customers, is your recommendation for, let's say, a small business, even if we're talking under a million and they want to get over a million, are you thinking the owner would reach out and ask their past customers or existing customers that question? Or do you recommend a third party source or combination so, or um, any? The first thing situation? that we did, um, th that's one of the activities that we do in the boot camp is um, we actually ask you to ask your customers. Start with a survey. First, you know, first one is thank you for using our service. And we even have a template that we share. Uh, thank you for using our service. You know, would like to know on a scale of one to 10, you know, how you liked it. And then some reasons why they may have liked it. And then understand when you selected that off my offering, what, you know, how long did it take and those types of things. But you should, you should ask your customers. Don't be afraid to have that conversation with your, your customers. Because if you don't, it's many times that your competitors will be doing that. I think that's a good example. I know when I used to have a corporate gift business, one of the things I had always heard is, you know, customers won't give you the answer, the real answer first. And I remember one time when we went out to one of our customers, or many of them, we'd say, you know, hey, how was the experience of working with us? Oh, it was fine. <laughs> and we were like, well, you know, I want more, right? You know, so we, right. I guess, yeah. you know, what's your I mean, opinion of digging deeper beyond surveys, I think, is oh, my well, question. But it's, it is, you have to go beyond, it's, anyone could just say, did you like it? Yes. Don't, mm -hmm. you know, and make it uh, not onerous, but there's a way that you can give it such that they can tell you why they liked it and what other things. So it's got to be more than a yes or no or one through five. 
you've got to include the why and how and what questions, such as, you know, um, how long did it take you to, on average, did it take you to decide to buy my product? Was it, you know, 30 days, one to to th one month to three months, four to six months, you know, more than six months. Um, you know, when you considered my offering, um, how many other competitors did you look at? Uh, one to three, um, you know, those types of things. You can make it simple because they're going to give you that insight. You've got to just ask more than just, you know, did you like it? Yes or no? Because they will right. tell you that. You know, you can do that in 10 questions. But, you know, and you can give them an incentive of, hey, you know, if you, uh, I understand you're busy, take, uh, take the time to do this. And as a result, you know, you get a chance to get either a Starbucks card or you get something. But, um, you know, being able to get that information is really important. I love that. I'm going to laugh only because I'm dating myself. I remember the old days when people would attach dollar bills to the letters, right? And mm -hmm. say, can you, can you take this survey? And now it's like a buck wouldn't even get you anything, right? It has to be like 20 bucks or something. Or, or like you said, a Starbucks card. Give them an incentive. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Well, here's a, here's a couple other questions. You know, this one's interesting. And, and the question is, is it, is it okay to stay small as a business? Yes. You have to do the first, the first thing was, how to build the business you love. If you love and are passionate about being small, stay small. You have to do what you enjoy doing because guess what? You're going to do what you enjoy doing. If you don't have the aspirations to do, to be a bigger business, then you're not going to be a bigger, bigger business. This message is for those people who say, gosh, I really want to do it, but I don't know how I'm afraid. And, and because of that, I don't want to do it. But if this is what you want to do, do what you want to do. And here's another question. These are great questions. It's like, so I, I'm, I'm founder to a service-based business. It's like, if I get investors, do they tell me, I'm just trying to read this. Do they tell me, do they tell me what to do is the question. It, it depends on the type of investors that you get. Um, if, you know, it depends, it depends. I mean, if you are, if you can gut it out and, and not, I mean, there's so many, one of the things that, you know, from being in the boot camp, we talk about there's eight different ways to fund. Now, now we co there's eight different ways to fund your business. And so you have to mm -hmm. figure out the way that allows you to keep the control. Um, to do it. And, and by doing all of this validation and all these things, most people um, don't go through and have a list of 10 people who say, you know what, we love what she's doing. And we're going to continue to use this for, you know, throughout the year and those types of things. But if you go through and you get money, or you got somebody to give you money without that validation, then you're gonna. Then there's much more risk involved, and with that risk, there's the request of transferring that control. Um, if you're able to take the time and make certain that you've done that validation and made certain that you've proven that there's definite demand and that you're a critical solution, then you're going to have a lot more options with how to fund you. Um, one uh, thing that people uh, have a mistake about sometimes how many businesses get funded. You know, um, you know, I use the example with Facebook. Um, they did not take on seven figures of funding until they got to a million users. And by doing mm. it that way, they retained a lot more control. And so sometimes, now, before that, that meant that they had less resources to operate on, um, and so, you know, there's alternative ways that you can do some things before you decide to pursue, you know, a huge amount of funding. And there's a misunderstanding that people have that think that, oh, I'm going to just have an idea and I'm going to get funded or I'm going to, you know, get funded and, um, you know, and, and, but to get funding, I've got to, you know, let go all control of my business. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. There's other, there's other options. 
Well, and I want to encourage everybody and our attendees and listeners, it's like, you know, take look at taking the boot camp. I mean, it really does open your eyes. I mean, I have to say just personally for me and CWI, for our association, I was going down a path that probably was not the best best path when I went through the boot camp. And we don't have to share, Kim, what you know about what path I was going down. And it, it forced me to really look at it and go, this is, this is not the vaccine. This is a me too kind of thing. And, um, you know, since then we've scaled back in a, in a better way, much more of the kind of niche you know, focus that we had and we know what business we're in. We started to veer off. It's very easy to do. I got to say, you know, we're on very limited time. This has been awesome. We are, I would love to have you back again for six through 10. I think our um, attendees would as well. What maybe can you leave us with, that, you know, at least one or two suggestions for so many of the female founders that listen into our webinars and are part of our association, that would be one or two key steps for them to really build their business and scale it to 10x or um, find their niche more effectively. Leave us on a high note. Can you inspire oh, us sure. with the ending? Oh, sure. <laughs> well, first, first and foremost, you can build the business that you want. Um, and there's resources out there to help you do it. You don't have to do it alone. Um, you know, so this is one way, this insight of this using a unique playbook that's designed to help you build a, a million, million dollar business that is feasible. The next is that there's great benefits by engaging with the right peer group and an experienced coach that can help you with transforming your business. For example, CWI is a great example of one of those positive peer groups because you're gonna meet some phenomenal women um, that will help you grow. You don't have to do this alone. Third is um, take the critical steps to own a niche market. If you choose to really want to have build that growing, thought, thriving, profitable business. Dang, those are pretty good. I like the second one that you said, of course, about connected women of influence, but I'm chuckling on that one. You are an amazing thought leader. I want to say thank you to you for giving us your expertise today for just round one. To all of our online attendees, I want to say thanks for joining us because, you know, we're going to be back again in two short weeks um, for another Women League webinar series for you to lead and achieve and succeed more as a female leader in business. So thank you for joining us, and we'll see you.